Thank you, Sandeep, for the introduction and invitation, and also to Piyush for inviting. So I'll be talking about uh, ARN models. And uh, so it's, it's a, a very old model, I mean, uh, dating back to about a century. Uh, but uh, this is like uh, an adaptive ARN, which has found uh, application in clinical trials and other things. So the almost sure and improbability behavior, that's what I'll be talking about. It's a joint work with Ujan Gongobadhyay, who was a master's student with me some years back. And now he's doing his uh, PhD in the University of S South California. Uh, so part of this work, this uh, the improbability convergence part that's already come out in Annals of Applied Probability, the last issue. And almost sure we are yeah, well, write, writing it, hopefully, it will be up on archive in, in some time. Uh, so I'll start with the basics and the models. So we'll be considering only ARN models with finitely many colors. Uh, so recently, there have been uh, quite some interesting work about, uh, so, so the infinite color is interesting. and. Uh, uh, recently, there, so there, there has been application in Bayesian modeling and things like that. Uh, so blackwell mcqueen uh, model uh, dating back to 70s maybe. And, but recently there have been some interesting work on arbitrary state space, like Polish, when the colors are in, uh, indexed by Polish space, uh, by two gr uh, groups, one uh, uh, by Antar Bandavadha and Devli Nathaka, who was uh, Antar's PhD student in ISI Delhi, and then there's other group uh, Cecil Meyer uh, in Bristol and her colleagues, Bristol or Bath? Bristol, yeah. Bath, okay, sorry. Uh, so, I mean, uh, they have uh, different sorts of approach. Cecil use what I'll be using, uh, Cecil in using uh, the stochastic approximation approach lately, but Ondor has a very interesting uh, uh, Markov chain, uh, branching Markov chain embedding and uh, he claims uh, that will solve everything, I, but we're not getting into that. We're keeping it to a more modest thing, uh, which is uh, finitely many colors. Uh, I'll, I'll point out on the way uh, where this uh, approach or, or where our approach uh, gets into some difficulties in extending to uh, arbitrary uh, color set. We are still working on it. I don't know whether it will work. Anyway, so to move on. So the main uh, uh, object of interest is the configuration vector. So we start with a uh, initial configuration C0. Uh, it's a k-dimensional vector. Each coordinate will be the amount of each color present in ARN. Uh, I'll be uh, kind of avoiding the traditional uh, ARN and ball configuration because when you say there are balls of different colors in the UN, uh, the amount will necessarily be integer valued, which, I, which is not really needed, as you'll see, and which I'll try to avoid. Uh, so the coordinates of this configuration vector, uh, at nth step, it will be Cn. The ith coordinate will be the amount of ith color that is present. And uh, so the Fn is the history up to time n. And this is how you draw a color. You, you don't really need to pick a ball. All you are interested in choosing the color, uh, you choose it at random. So given the past history, you choose the ith color. So the color that you choose, I'll uh, denote it by a vector that only helps me with the algebra later. Uh, so if you choose the ith color, I'll indicate it by the ith coordinate vector. So chi n will be the indicator of the ith, uh, indicator of the nth draw, color in the nth draw, that will be EI with probability proportion to the amount of color present. So it's drawing at random, the usual thing that we understand. And once you draw color, the usual thing that you do, you return that ball in the uh, first uh, probability course that they teach you with the polio earn model. You return that ball and you add some more balls of the same color, which is you, uh, sort of like reinforce each colors, and that will be uh, summarized uh, by a matrix, which we'll, be co uh, we'll call as replace replacement matrix, and denoted by Rn. But unlike that uh, first probability uh, course, we'll not re require these matrices to be deterministic, neither to be same over time. These matrices are and can be random. Uh, 
we expect all the quantities to be non-negative so that you don't pull out balls for, from the urn. Uh, you can handle that, but we are not doing it. It just adds to the messiness. Uh, and we'll assume that all these RNs to have all the coordinates of RN, there are k square many coordinates, they all have finite means. We're not even assuming any IID or any such thing. Later, uh, we'll sh show that, I mean, if you make more assumptions, you get, uh, I mean, you get more results. Uh, so as of now, these replacement matrices are random. All entries are non-negative almost surely, and all entries have finite mean. And what is the dependent structure? You need to assume sh something, but, okay. So if I draw ith color, so I look at the, ith row of this matrix and add it. So I add Rn ij many, Rn ij amount of color g. Uh, and that, uh, so this is how the things evolve. You add Cn minus one, and then you choose the color chi n. If it's ei, then you add ith row of Rn. So Cn is equal to Cn minus one plus chi n Rn. And the uh, dependent structure is uh, all that we assume that chi n and r n, the drawl and the reinforcement, they should be conditionally independent of the past. Okay? Uh, but I'm not disallowing this r n to depend on past as well, because that's something which is uh, useful in uh, clinical trials, and that's why they called it adaptive r n uh, in. Uh, that sort of scenario. Yeah, so chi n uh, can depend on rn minus one, rn can depend on fn minus one, but they are conditionally independent given the past. So once you know the uh, n minus one at step history, what you do in this step, they shouldn't depend on each other, but individually they can depend on the past. I, don't, I mean, obviously in any model, chi n has to depend on past, otherwise, you know, like this whole model uh, collapses. But rn, can be free of past. We'll be looking at those cases. And Rn can be independent of chi n as well. Uh, uh, so, I mean, not only conditionally independent, just independent. So some notations that will be useful. So Sn will be total color count. Uh, that is, you look at how much quantity you have. Uh, and this is what you start with. And amount you add at each trial is Sn minus one, Sn, Sn minus Sn minus one, that I will denote by Yn. That is the sum of the row that you choose, and that's random. In the traditional case, generally you assume it to be constant, but here it's going to be random. I'm not saying that uh, the row sums of Rn are constant or anything. I'm not putting any such assumption. And this is also the interesting thing. This is a color count vector. So chi n is the color that you uh, uh, draw at small nth time. So this sum tells you up to capital nth time how many times each color is drawn. Okay. So this is the total amount because each time you may put in a different amount of colors and this is how many times each color is drawn. So these are the two to uh, objects of interest and they are kind of closely related. So there are two objects that I'll be interested in uh, using. One is row A, that is a maximum absolute row sum. Since our uh, matrices have non-negative entries, it's a maximum row sum. It's also the operator norm of the corresponding matrix. And sigma A is the, corres is the corresponding minimum absolute row sum. Uh, and the crucial thing will be the conditional replacement matrix, conditional expectation of replacement matrix, which in literature is generally called generating matrix, and I'll denote it by Hn minus one. So that will be the crucial factor and how it behaves. Uh, that's uh, enough to study uh, for improbability convergence. When you do almost sure convergence, we need to, I mean, there will be some, uh, no, like there will be restriction on moment conditions, uh, it's something like the truncation argument that you usually do for proof of strong law of large number with just one moment finite. Again, maybe the second course in probability, uh, or third course in the probability. So we look at the truncated conditional expectation as well, and that will be denoted by H tilde. 
So we'll need to make assumption on the truncated matrix as well, okay? So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, re uh, recall the notations as we'll go along. So these are the objects that we have. So that was my, so let's, let's uh, look at the results uh, that we know. Uh, one of the big results are due to Bai and Hu in Analysis of Applied Probability 2005. So what they assumed is that Rn has, all entries of Rn has two plus delta moments, a little more than two moments. And they assumed this uh, Hn, the generating matrix, to be stochastic. That is the row sums are all one. And also they assumed, so you're not make, making any assumption on the distribution uh, of a, Rn or Hn to be identical, but you have to have some sort of concentration behavior. So what they assume is that Hn is close to some met, irreducible matrix H, in this sense, that is, 1 over n distance between Hn and H, that should be finite. So for example, this will imply Hn converges to H in Cesaro. That's what just by Kronecker's lemma. And then they use some Martingale uh, techniques to show that H is a transition matrix, so it has a stationary, it's irreducible, so it has a unique stationary distribution pi H, so the almost Cn by N will converge almost surely to pi H. Yeah? Sorry? Hn is also random, but it converges to something in their model, to something non-random. Uh, so this is uh, finite almost surely. No, this, no, no, so, so Hn is close to H. This is closest, uh, so, so you expect this thing to be finite almost surely. That's all, all I need. That, that's all they need. Um, I, did, I should have written the almost surely, sorry. So in that sense, they're close. That means that will imply Hn will converge to H in Cesaro sense, almost surely, in particular. And we'll see later that, assuming that weaker condition, that Cesaro convergence is good enough. Uh, their proof inherently used this condition. And then, uh, a few years later, Laruel and Pages has uh, used as far as I know, they first particularly used the stochastic approximation method uh, to this problem. And uh, they assumed only two moments, not two plus delta moments. And they assumed Hn should converge to H almost surely in the norm sense. That also implies Cesaro convergence. And they also showed the same thing. And they used stochastic approximation on the Cn by N. So the crucial thing is the denominator for them is non-random. We'll come back to this, why, uh, I mean, what's, what about the denominator? Uh, however, this proof had some mistake, and then uh, Zhang in 2016 came up with the modification, so for, uh, and corrected the mistake, and then he extended it. So he first of all assumed this, he removed this uh, restriction that HN, H, they have to be balanced, that, that is the row sums are same. He removed that condition, and he only assumed that, he assumed that HN converges to H almost surely only in Cesaro sense. So that's the weaker than both converges or the sum is finite. And then he had the same result under two moments assumption. Now this two or two plus delta moments were there because they were trying to prove something like a central limit theorem. So naturally there's just two moment assumption. But Zhang had another paper in Science China in 2012. So one of the referees pointed that out to us. Uh, where he showed, uh, he considered this uh, law of large number kind of results that, that we are considering. And they showed that if all entries of Rn have L log L to the power P, P slightly bigger than one moments finite, then Cn by N converges to pi H almost surely. And furthermore, if we have the IID case, that is Rn's are IID, if you make further assumption that Rn is an IID sequence, and uh, then only L log L moment suffice. And one thing that we are going to do in almost every case, uh, case that we'll have this result uh, but we'll improve this L log L to showing that just 
first moment suffice. Initially, we are stuck. Uh, we thought like L log L is very natural because there is some inherent martingale there. So L log L is uh, pretty natural stuff, but then we saw that it's, it still goes. Yeah. Uh, so because of stochastic approximation, they still used the uh, non-random denominator. And because of uh, uh, stochastic approximation, they had to solve some ODE. Uh, but that ODE was very difficult. We'll reduce it to a simpler one. Uh, I'll, I'll indicate it. Maybe I'll not go through this entire uh, proof thing. I'll just indicate it. So first of all, can we uh, relax the moment conditions? And here, this H still is non-random. Can we have random limit? And how about simplifying the ODE? And there was this another question. Can you weaken these assumptions on almost everywhere to improbability and still get some result? Kind of weak law of large numbers. It's, it's L, L log L means uh, expectation of rho Rn times log of rho Rn, supremum over N that is finite. That's sort of like what I say, L log L bounded. Like L1 bounded means all the first moments finite, so it's the L log L moments. All right, so here are the assumptions. So, uh, I mean, uh, you need some uniform integrability assumption, otherwise uh, things become a bit of messy. Uh, so in case of improbability convergence, it's good enough to assume that rho Rn, that's the norms, are uniformly integrable. That will suffice. Uh, but in almost every case, you need something more. There are two possibilities that we worked on. That is, it's something like what Zhang in his 2012 paper did. That is, it's L log L to the power P bounded, which again gives us, because it's a bit more than L1 bounded, or the distributions of rho Rns are majorized by this random variable R with finite mean. So there is a constant C, and the distribution of rho, uh, tail of rho Rn is bounded by C times tail of R. That's, that's the usual majorization condition. So it uh, says like at least in, towards the tail that uh, the behaviors are not too wildly different. And this R should have finite mean. So that's kind of the L1 condition. Uh, one sufficient condition, obviously, is if, if these guys are IIT. In fact, uh, all you need is not, not IID is not important, you need identically distributed, but then I'll have another set of conditions which will require, for where the sufficient condition will be independence, so why not put them together? Okay. And then, like uh, in all the past cases, this HN should be close to H in some sense, so in probability case, I assume that Hn converges to H in Cesaro sense in probability. So I'll uh, conclude that converges in probability, so I'm making a corresponding weak assumption that the closeness is only in probability. And in the almost sure case, you make the corresponding assumption to be almost sure, but the crucial thing is here you use the truncated conditional expectation. So that's sort of a bit ugly. Uh, you don't really like it. So here are uh, sufficient conditions for this to hold. And there are two of them. So first one is the generating matrix should converge to H in Cesaro sense, almost surely. That's, that's a very natural analog of what you had or what uh, the literature results had. But then you have this truncated business, so you have to take care of the tail conditional expectation. That should be negligible in Cesaro sense. That's, it's just uh, you know, like rewriting this thing in two pieces and making sure that each of the terms go to zero individually. Uh, this thing you cannot, I mean, I don't know. You have to just check it. But you want to find some good sufficient conditions for this to hold. And, okay, uh, so I'll come to the good sufficient condition for the second thing to hold, but because of uniform integrability, this convergence will also be in L1 then. So, this is the 
tail negligibility condition and what are the sufficient conditions. Uh, you remember R, R was the, I mean, if you assume the majorized thing, then it's good enough to assume that uh, the majorizing random variable has L log L moment finite, R log R should be finite. So you don't need L log L to the power P, just L log L which will suffice. Or if you assume the Rn to be independent of past, then just L1 moment suffice. In particular, if Rn is an IID sequence independent of uh, colors drawn, that's the model Zhang considered and required L log L moments. This will go through with only L1 moments. Or you have this uh, condition of the Zhang. So whatever be your condition, uh, we have the, yeah. So this, is, this was the majorizing uh, random variable. Yeah, um, yeah. So you need the tails to be not too dissimilar. So we need some assumptions on H. Uh, first of all, that H has to be irreducible, but we are not assuming H to be uh, balanced. That is the uh, row sums are same, so it's not the, exactly not the thing that you have in Markov chain class, but it's in the same spirit. That is for each pair of, uh, each co uh, pair of coordinates, i and j, there will be some power which depends on i, j, uh, such that h power k has that corresponding coordinate, strictly positive. That is, you can have a path of length k from i to j in the Markov chain uh, terminologies. And since H is irreducible, you will have the, uh, you know, like the minimum, you cannot have any row completely disappearing because that will kill the irreducibility. And since there are only finitely many colors, the row sums will always be finite. I mean, these are possibly random. These are possibly random. When I'm saying finite, they're finite almost surely, or positive almost surely. And by peron frobenius theory, H will have an eigenvalue with, uh, which is simple and which has largest possible uh, modulus. Corresponding left eigenvector will be pi H, which will be a probability vector. All coordinates strictly positive, the standard peron frobenius theory, and there will be a right eigenvector. So under this and, and this, peron frobenius eigenvalue will be stuck between these two things, and these inequalities will be strict unless you have all the row sums same. And under that condition, so you look at Cn by Sn. Cn by Sn is the proportion vector, right? How much of what proportion, so in the total bin, what proportion of each color is there? And that will converge to uh, this peron frobenius left eigenvector, which in the usual balanced case will be the stationary distribution. And if you want to replace this Sn by something non-random, you would want to bring in that scale, and Sn scales like n, and that converges to lambda h. In uh, usual balanced case, lambda h will be taken to be one. Uh, so whatever the Cn by n converges to then lambda h pi h. And nn, you remember that's the color, how many times you draw each color, uh, that also scales like n to pi h. And all these convergence are in almost sure an L1, if you assume the almost sure conditions, and in probability an L1, okay, if it's an L1, then it's also in probability, uh, if you assume the in probability assumptions, uh, like I described before. The proofs run, uh, to, uh, run in parallel to quite a bit of ex extent, in the sense both of them uh, use stochastic approximation, but when you check the individual conditions of stochastic approximation, that's where the proofs tend to diverge. So this is the model and the results. So any questions up till now? Okay, so next uh, part that I want to cover is the technique that I use, which is stochastic approximation. So uh, some of you uh, may already be familiar with it, but there are people who may not be. So I thought I'll still take the risk and try to tell you what the story is about. So this is, uh, so uh, this section is uh, more general in the sense uh, so th 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 uh, this, is, this is a general technique, and then 
if I have time to do this last section, I'll be using it to the R model. So what is a stochastic approximation? So it's an evolution, uh, discrete time. So Xn's evolve, and this is the evolution form. So Xn plus one is equal to Xn plus An h of Xn plus An beta of n. Uh, and I'll tell you what are they. So we'll assume this x sense to be bounded, and taking value in some bounded set. Beta n will be error, so it will go to zero in some sense. In what sense we'll uh, talk about that. A n a step size, non, they will typically satisfy these conditions, a n positive, a n greater than zero, and summation a n diverge. Summation a n greater than zero in the sense uh, the steps should be finer and fi narrower and narrower, so you don't leave too many things. And summation a n is infinity gives you, you cover the entire positive half line by looking at the partial sums of a n. Typically, you assume that a n's are square summable because that's a good sufficient condition, but we don't really need that. We need something else which will come in a minute. H we call the driving function uh, from RK to RK and we take it to be continuous. So here is a uh, trick, how the trick goes. So TNs, as I said, are the partial sums of the ANs. And what I do is I look at this TN comma XN. So, so XN is the value at time TN and I plot them and X naught is the linear interpolate. So you join them linearly piecewise. And what happens, what you call xn is you take this x0 and shift uh, the origin on the x-axis from 0 to tn. So xn t is x0 t plus tn. The origin grows from 0 to tn. And what happens is then this small xn, that's our concern, it becomes xn0. So I'll actually be looking at this convergence of this uh, process xn, and from that I'll uh, conclude about small xn. And similarly, uh, I have these error terms, and I look at their partial sums, and b0 is the corresponding linear interpolate, the tn bn, and what b superscript n is, you shift the origin to 0 comma bn. Okay? And then if you sit down and do a bit of messy uh, algebra, you get this nice integral equation. Xn t is Xn zero plus zero to t h of Xn s ds plus bn t plus some more error term en t. And as you would expect, they will soon disappear and you would get a nice differential equation. So that's what precisely happens. So you show that Xn's are relatively compact by some means. Uh, that's one big problem we have when we try to extend it to the general Polish space, finding good sufficient condition on the uh, ARN model so that the corresponding Xn becomes relatively compact. Uh, so what Cecil and uh, her colleague uh, do is that they assume some Lyapunov type con condition uh, to force this compactness. And then you show, as I said, Bn and En are negligible processes, they have to be negligible as processes, and then any subsequential limit of xn will satisfy x dot equal to h of x, the corresponding differential equation, because these two terms have now disappeared. And if you know that the corresponding ODE has unique solution, restricted to that bounded subset, then all subsequential limits should be that thing, so if that unique solution is z, then xn0, which is small xn, will converge to z0. That is the basic idea of this whole stochastic approximation. But you need some condition on that beta n error term. So what are they? So to do that, uh, we need this level crossing times. So when you are in, when you are looking at bn, what you are doing is you are starting from, your origin is now at tn. And then from Tn, you are moving another T time. So between Tn to Tn plus T, how many ANs come in? Right? Then you have to calculate the Bn, which is the uh, partial sum of Am beta M. So you have to look at those starting from Tn and how many you get 
capture to go to Tn plus T. So that's how you have it. And also, similarly, on the negative side, this is what is captured. And then you have this ugly looking term, uh, expression. I really don't want, want you to uh, see and understand it. What is crucial is that these are all between 0 and 1. So to make them disappear, what you have to do is you have to look at this partial sums of a m beta m to go to 0. And those are the forward and backward delayed sum. And these are the conditions that need to go to 0. So that's the assumption you need to check. And what happens is, uh, uh, so this, this entire uh, argument is free of any randomness. When you do almost sure, you can just require this to happen almost surely. But checking these things are a bit too messy. So you hope some useful sufficient condition which I'll show you for the almost sure case. But unfortunately, uh, for the improbability case, we didn't find any shortcut. So you have to sit down and check these two things. And since uh, these are then convergence in probability and not almost sure convergence, you have to check both the forward and backward delayed sum separately. So that requires a bit more work. So almost sure case, xn bounded, Taking, I think this should be small xn. Bounded taking value in s, these are all small xn, they have somehow become capital. Okay, uh, so that's a stochastic approximation equation. Now, suppose you, I'm not ruling out ans to be random. That was the constraint that Zhang or uh, Laruel Pages uh, uh, had that they had an to be precisely one over n. They took it non-random. But that made their differential equation look very ugly. It became a, uh, so h became a rational function. So solving the differential equation was a bit of mess. Uh, but in principle, there is no restriction. All, you, all we'll be assuming, you can have n more general. All I'll be assuming that n is like 1 over n. I'll prove that. Uh, so then uh, these usual re requirements of n will satisfy naturally. In fact, it will also have this square summable thing. And uh, we'll assume the driving function to be continuous in x. And z is the unique solution of this ODE. And once you make this assumption, then this bad and ugly assumption about the error terms, they will simplify to this simple thing, that is the errors should be negligible in Cesaro sense. And that's what we are essentially assuming some, at some place. The errors to be Cesaro negligible. So that requires that n should be of order of 1 by n. And then you have the usual result, and this convergence is almost sure. Uh, this limit depends on g, which can possibly be random, so the limit can be random. In probability case, you, fall, you not only assume this h is continuous in x, you need h to be jointly continuous in g and x. And oh, I had one more assumption which I think I missed. So uh, in the probability case, you remember this uh, solution depends on g. So in probability case, we further need to assume the solution at zero at least, should be continuous in G, which should be easy in our case. And then you have to show that delayed sums of errors to go to zero in probability, both the forward and the backward one. And then you have the usual result that convergence is in L1 and hence in probability. So that's what the technique is. Any questions till now? Okay. If not, I think I have some time to finish uh, or to uh, show, you, show you a sketch of the proof. So the idea is now to rewrite the evolution equation of the ARN model in a fashion which fits into the stochastic approximation and then check the appropriate condition. So here is the big difference from what Laruel Pages or Zhang did uh, so we consider the 
extends to be Cn over Sn, the proportion. Here the advantage is the solution uh, or, or, or this extends naturally become bounded because it's proportion vector. It's in that probability simplex. But for uh, the other cal uh, calculations, so Laruel Pages used uh, balanced thing. So Sn was essentially uh, a constant times n plus some constant. So for them, even Cn by n would have been similar, but Zhang ended up having a nightmare of a thing, but somehow he managed that. Now, as I mentioned, Cecil Meyer and uh, her uh, co-author, they also look at, the, at this thing using stochastic approximation in uh, uh, arbitrary polystate space. So they have a much more interesting approach, uh, possibly that helps them in life. So instead of, they also look at something which is proportion, hence bounded, and also has a constant denominator. So what they do is they don't look at Cn over Sn, they look at Nn, you remember how many times you draw a color, that vector, that adds up to n, because you in time n you only draw n times. So they look at Nn by n, so it solves both the problems in the sense you get a bounded object and the denominator is non-random. It's precisely one over n. The, scale, the step size is precisely one over n. So in my case, the step size will be one over Sn. And what is the driving function? This h. This driving function is xh minus x, xh one transpose. So you have to solve the differential equation that x dot equal to h of x. So what is the differential equation now? It's a first order and this thing is quadratic. So it's a first order quadratic differential equation. So it's not that they will teach you in uh, first differential equation course, and my problem, my, both the problem with me and Ujan is we never did anything beyond first uh, differential equation course. So we never saw this thing, first order quadratic differential equation thing, but then uh, a bit of search will tell you that this is the classical lotka volterra equation on which you have tomes and tomes of uh, research. But as always, uh, you find everything other than what you want. So there are different sorts of lotka volterra analyzing everything except what we needed uh, because it turned out that our, what, I, what we needed is actually can be left as an exercise. Uh, it's, you can easily reduce it to a first order linear differential equation. So I'll, I'll talk about it later. But that sort of uh, removes that huge uh, difficulty that Zhang had to face because he had h to be some very complicated ran, uh, rational function. And then the error term dn is obtained from this object delta n and dn is dn is basically a Martingale difference term. So in case of probability convergence, I look at the corresponding Martingale difference term, and I'll use Martingale results to manage, show that this dn's go to zero in uh, Cesaro sense. And in almost your case, as I have been suggesting, uh, that I will be, instead of centering it with the conditional expectation, I'll be using the truncated conditional expectation. That's, uh, and then still manage somehow. And this zeta n will be the remaining part which will again come in terms of this driving function. And for almost sure this h n minus one should be replaced by the h tilde because you have made a wrong centering here, so to speak. Okay, so that's how you fit it into the, uh, the, stochastic approximation scenario. So all it now boils down to is show that this one Sn is roughly growing like N, and then you have to show that this one has only one bounded solution, which is pi H, and also take care of the error terms. So since I have four minutes, let's see what we can do. So step size. So we have to show that Sn, uh, 
is of order n. So Sn by n, you can show with probability 1 is bounded between sigma h and rho h. Since sigma h is positive and rho h is finite, that takes care of it. Sn is of order n. You have to do it only omega by omega. Uh, so that's not a problem. The problem is, uh, and then you have the usual results. The problem is in case of improbability. So you have to uh, be a bit more careful. So what you do is, you look at this. Remember, these were the level crossing times which we did for an. So you do the similar thing for the deterministic step size, 1 over n, and call it tn of t. And then you show that Sn and n, they are roughly of same order. So you, uh, you look at the event where they are roughly of same order and show that this complement of this event is contained in these two events, sigma h less than 2b and rho h bigger than a by 2. And since rho h is a finite random variable and sigma h is a positive random variable, you can, by choosing a and b appropriately, you can, uh, sigma h is a finite and rho h, sigma h is a positive and rho h is a finite random variable, you can make this uh, probabilities are arbitrarily small so that these things, be, this event becomes a large prob, high probability event. And on this event, you show that things are nice, and then you let A and B go to appropriate directions, whichever direction, I always get confused. B goes to zero, A goes to infinity. To handle uh, the error terms, maybe I'll skip this error term business, that will take me too long. So maybe I'll quickly tell you uh, in two minutes that I have, uh, because I like that once we uh, solve this small assignment of lotka voltaire equation, maybe those who are uh, more familiar, they, they would be very, say like, I mean, it's not even an uh, assignment, but anyway, so here you do it. So you look at the matrix H and look at its Jordan decomposition, H equal to VJU, J is that block, uh, J is that upper triangular matrix, and the first block, first Jordan block will be corresponding to the peron frobenius eigenvalue, that's block of size one, and the corresponding uh, U1 will be pi H, the left peron frobenius eigenvector, and zeta H. So what you do is you first do the transformation Y equal to X times phi. And then Y1 becomes this object, just an algebra. And since x is probability, y becomes bounded. And since zeta h is positive, that's Peron Frobenius theorem, y1 will be positive. And then you do the second transformation, that z is y by y1. Then z is normalized so as the first coordinate is identically 1. And then this differential equation, after you sit down and do the algebra, or calculus, or whatever, uh, it becomes z dot equal to z times r specific matrix, which is first order linear differential equation, which we all know has the solution z t equal to z naught into e to the power t times this matrix. Now, we not only need this solution, we want a solution which is bounded because uh, z is bounded. The problem is you don't have too many bounded solution because from the second coordinate onwards, the eigenvalues, the real part will be less than lambda h. That's by the peron frobenius theory. And so, zeta, if zeta is zero is not zero for i bigger than one, then zeta t becomes unbounded. So, they have all to be zero, so z becomes e1, going back xt becomes y1t pi h. But x has to be a proportion vector. Pi h is already a proportion vector, so x becomes the only possible solution, which is a probability vector is pi h, so it has a unique solution. Okay, good. Uh, so that's essentially what I wanted you to see, that uh, differential equation becomes uh, easy, and then you essentially, uh, then you have the result for Cn by Sn. For Sn by N, you write down the Martingale part, and then look at the correction terms, and once you have Sn by N, then you can get Cn by N from there, because you already know Cn by Sn. 
And then you again look at the SN by looking at the Martingale difference, Martingale part and the remaining part. This becomes a L2 bounded Martingale and you know the limit of CN by SN, so, so thank you.